The jury deliberates during the Leslie Chance murder trial. Students gather to remember a classmate killed at Foothill High School. And fog on the roadways hampers driving in Bakersfield. This is 17 News at Noon. Good afternoon, I'm Alex Fisher. You were just watching an NBC News special report on the impeachment trial of President Trump. You can continue watching on our KGET Facebook page. We will resume that special report coming up after this newscast. But things are just getting started on this third day of opening arguments. Jay Gray has been following the proceedings and has more from Washington. Democrats return to Senate chambers today confident they've set a high bar in their case for impeaching the president. No president has ever used his office to compel a foreign nation to help him cheat in our elections. House managers detailing a laundry list of what they call overwhelming and damning evidence against President Trump, sharing documents and witness testimony and calling for the White House to release more. The articles are overwhelmingly supported by the evidence amassed by the House, notwithstanding the president's complete stonewalling. President Trump responding online this morning, calling the opening arguments lies and misrepresentations and writing, no matter what you give the radical left do-nothing Democrats, it will never be enough. The president and his supporters say the impeachment case is one driven not by the law, but politics. What they did in the House has been partisan from day one. Most of the evidence is hearsay, no ability to call witnesses. The president's defense team anxious for their turn to speak. Our position has been consistent. We, they've got to meet a burden to do that. We don't think they will. House managers continue that effort today. They will have this session and tomorrow if needed to wrap their arguments and then the president's lawyers begin their presentation. Jay Gray, NBC News, Washington. Jurors in the Leslie Chance murder trial are deliberating today. Closing arguments wrapped up yesterday. Chance was on the stand for three days during the trial. Defense attorney Tony Lidget says it has been excruciating process for Chance, who is accused of killing her husband in 2013. Meanwhile, prosecutor Arthur Norris walked the jury through evidence he believes points to Chance as the killer. Norris told jurors Chance killed her husband out of jealousy and for financial gain. On Wednesday, Legit argued the prosecution's evidence is built entirely on assumptions. Now, we are awaiting a verdict. If Chance is found guilty, she faces life in prison. A candlelight vigil was held for the student killed at Foothill High School during an after-school fight. A large crowd gathered outside the school to remember the 17-year-old. Friends described the student as respectful and loving. They said he wanted to do well in school and graduate. Tuesday's fight was captured in graphic images and videos that circulated social media pages. Images like this one. We altered it to protect the privacy of the victim. Here you can see a young man with a knife in his hand and covered in blood. In the background, a teen kneeling is also covered in blood. And behind him, a third person bent over in the middle of the street. Deputies responded to the area around 2.30 on Tuesday. The student died. Two more people were uh, stabbed but survived and now under arrest. They include 23-year-old Jason Cruz and a 14-year-old boy who was arrested on suspicion of assault with a deadly weapon. The name of the student that died has not been released. And we have learned reports of a threat at Foothill High School and in the surrounding area are not credible. That's according to KCSO. Deputies say they are aware of rumors of a circulating social media post threatening a potential shooting at Foothill, but they confirm they are not credible. Dense fog is being blamed for a bad crash on Stockdale Highway earlier this morning. Take a look at this mangled car. The crash happened around 8.30 this morning on Stockdale Highway. CHP says the car you see here was driving on Stockdale when a semi-truck exiting Interstate 5 was making a left turn onto the highway. The car slammed into the semi, completely going under the trailer. It looks like a gruesome crash, but CHP officers say the people inside were wearing seatbelts and it saved their lives. Two adults and a five-year-old inside the car have minor to moderate injuries. CHP is blaming dense fog for the crash. And speaking of the fog, it was very dense this morning, uh, right as people were going out and about throughout the day. And you can see right now from our Adventist Health Cam, the fog, although not dense, it's still lingering. It definitely is still out there. And fog's one of those things where it can just uh, appear 
and uh, it's uh, we're at its mercy as to when it will burn off. It came in uh, pretty quick, right around uh, 630 this morning. We were seeing it a little to the north. This is what it looks like downtown right now from our uh, studio camera. So definitely it is uh, still quite foggy, and this was actually time lapse, excuse me, from earlier this morning as the fog kind of came on in for our morning commute. And we take a look at the visible satellite right now, and you can see still being picked up on the visible satellite, having a hard time burning that off. And we've been talking about uh, advisories. The dense fog advisory was in place. We just uh, canceled that out just seconds ago. Uh, so it looks like improvements will start to uh, happen throughout the afternoon. We sit at 52 degrees right now with a westerly wind at 7. But out at Meadows Field, we're at one mile on the visibility. Here's a look at the temperatures throughout the afternoon. We are still expecting the lower 60s if we can burn this fog off. And again, we'll just have to see uh, how much sunshine appears a little later. 59 degrees up in the Tehachapi area of a southeast wind at 15 and a nice day in the temperatures with the upper 50s sliding back into the 30s by midnight. More weather to come in just a few minutes, Alex. All right, Kev, thanks so much. This morning, 1,200 people gathered for the annual Bakersfield Prayer Breakfast. The now four-decade-old tradition brings people together to pray, regardless of their faith or political views. The event's chairman, Doug Carter, appeared this morning on 17 News at Sunrise and praised the support this breakfast gets every year from the Bakersfield community. Everyone checks our differences at the door. We come in unity and we lift one another up, encourage one another, and pray for our community. Today's keynote speaker was Rocky Fleming, founder of Influencers Global Ministries. The author and motivational speaker focused his speech on peace and unity within our community. There's now a new location for a low-barrier shelter, a homeless shelter in Bakersfield. The proposed locations for the shelter has been the subject of a heated debate for months now. The meeting last night went on for nearly five hours as the council discussed the proposition. 17's Karen Waugh was there and has more. In this packed house, everyone agrees homelessness is a crisis in Kern County. The disagreement is where to put a new low barrier shelter. It will also provide them with the dignity of being able to bring along their pets, their possessions, their partners. The location up for vote? The current Calcott property on East Brundage Lane near Mount Vernon Avenue. It's seven acres and has space for 450 beds. It would include wraparound services like for mental health as well as a Bakersfield police substation. Some believe this is a crucial step toward mitigating homelessness. It's cold, it's raining. The homeless people are hurting here in Bakersfield. We are at a crossroads in our community with the opportunity to address the crisis that we have in the right way and in a comprehensive manner, building a system-wide response for all that are experiencing homelessness. Others are flat out opposed to the location or the shelter altogether. Along with the homeless um, population comes a lot of mental illness, drug abuse, and crime. My concern is also the size, okay? Uh, I propose under 200 beds max. When we talk about adding a low barrier homeless shelter in a double digit unemployment community that's inhumane. You have just taken yet another stab at this community opportunity to thrive. Calcott's going to cost $7.2 million, and then you heard that it's going to be at a minimum 2 to $2.5 million a year to operate. You know, I'm obviously not supportive of it. Ward 2 Council Member Andre Gonzalez ultimately made three proposals for a vote. The purchase of the Calcott property passed narrowly, four to three. Motion passes with Vice Mayor Parlier. Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Sullivan voting no. Gonzalez also proposed a neighborhood improvement plan for the surrounding area, and he proposed a partnership with the county to tackle homelessness. Both passed. Motion is unanimously approved. The Calcott property is the only option that gives us shelter space, room for a day center, and offices for support providers to help people transition into housing and gives us capacity to grow in the future. That was 17's Karen Waugh reporting. A chemical leak in Taft prompted a massive emergency response and widespread evacuations. Those recommend, recommended evacuations were listed la, or lifted last night. The call came in around 10 a.m. yesterday of a possible chemical leak at the Taft Manufacturing Company on South Lake Road. All 30 employees were evacuated 
Anyone within a six-mile radius of the plant was also asked to leave. Kern County Fire, Hazmat Crews, and law enforcement officers all responded. The Office of Emergency Services says a large container that was shipped to Taft Manufacturing from overseas was received in leaking condition. About three hours after the initial call, KCFD found the source and stopped it. It was a product known as acrylion. Uh, this is an inhalant, it's a pesticide slash herbicide, and because of uh, the, the nature and risk that it does pose to health, uh, it was treated with an abundance of respect and caution. Acrylion can be toxic to humans and cause eye, nasal, and respiratory problems. The evacuation recommendation was lifted around 7 o'clock last night. It is a sweet treat that makes a lot of people smile, but the reaction from one toddler is going viral. We'll show you after this. Welcome back. If you literally want to see love of ice cream at first sight, not to mention first taste, check out this baby video gone massively viral. Jeannie Moose has more. Do you remember your first time? That was the first ice cream that she ever, she ever tasted. What a scoop for a nine-month-old. <laughs> <laughs> it was Blakely Rose Jernigan's first taste of ice cream and first taste of viral fame. The bug eyes and the grabby hands were the clinchers, typical for her spitfire daughter, says mom. Yeah, she's very expressive. She makes the cutest little scrunchy smiles. She's, she's so silly. Famous worldwide now, adorable in any language. Get yourself someone who looks at you the way this baby looks at ice cream. Vanilla. To be exact, a perfect blend of vanilla and chocolate ice cream with a caramel ribbon. Baskin Robbins proudly posted, too cute. Just think, this California girl could grow up to be vice president. My name is Joe Biden and I love ice cream. Or even president. Remember how at the dessert course, President Trump gets two scoops of vanilla ice cream with his chocolate cream pie instead of the single scoop for everyone else. Two scoops, two scoops for me, please. And two or three more bites for me. <laughs> Jeannie Mose, CNN, New York. Please let go, let go. <laughs> Where mean, is, that reaction is priceless. Where has Jeannie Moe's been? <laughs> I love Jeannie Moe's packages, and I saw that on Facebook and thought it was adorable. Just her eyes. just That's how I, uh, my eyes looked when I had my first bite of ice cream. Outside, hey, look at this. We can actually see the streets of Bakersfield. The fog is finally starting to lift, and we're actually getting a peak of some sunshine, and that will continue as we go throughout the day. Take a look at other areas, and 52 in uh, uh, Wasco and partly uh, sunny. We've got some clouds still hanging around the Arvin area as the fog tries to lift out that way. Fraser Park, beautiful, mostly sunny and 56. And Golden Hills, we've got sunny skies and a temperature right now of 60. Here's a look at other temperatures. We've got some 50s out on the west side and then for the mountains, 59 in Tatchby, 62 for Lake Isabella and upper 50s for Ridgecrest. And here's a look at our visibility and the only fog that we're seeing still is here in Bakersfield out of Meadows Field, still looking at one mile visibility. Areas to the north, if you're traveling that direction, everything has is lifted, so that's a good thing. Here's a look at the regional view. We have got this ridging offshore here that is pushing to the east for us today. We have another front moving into the Pacific Northwest into Northern California. We're going to be watching a system to roll on into our area as we head into Saturday and Sunday with a chance of rain. Models have been back and forth, whether we're going to see much of it. And you can see as we look at this first model, brings everything more northerly. And then by Saturday, late into Sunday, it wants to bring some of those showers into Kern County before it's pretty much out of here. So I'm not expecting a lot of rain. You can see by next Tuesday, another storm impacts the state, but more in a northerly fashion. Let's talk about the snowpack and the northern Sierra right now at 82% of normal. The central at 74. There's a snow survey today. We'll get a better idea of that. And and then the Southern Sierra at 76% of normal. So our numbers are actually down from where we were last year at this time. And an area where we always kind of look is up near uh, South Lake Tahoe, a beautiful place during the wintertime. And uh, I will be there 
looking at this beautiful shot, and I'm going to share it with you as well next week on Monday and Tuesday on Sunrise. I'll be live at South Lake Tahoe for a weather conference, and we're going to do uh, some live coverage for you. So if you've never been to Lake Tahoe, I'm going to bring it to you uh, next week on Sunrise. Air quality today will be moderate with an AQI at 80, and today we'll call for, again, we've got that fog out there. It should lift and uh, clear out 63 in Bakers Hill, 62 McFarland, upper 50s in Taft for the mountains and the Kern River Valley. Sunny skies today, 54 in Fraser Park. We'll look at the 50s out of the Taft area and right near 60 into the Kern River Valley. And then for the desert, beautiful day ahead and high of 59 in Mojave. Here's your extended forecast and the chance of showers Saturday into Sunday, uh, right around a tenth of an inch on the high side, low side about five hundredths of an inch. And then for the mountains also the weekend, bringing a chance of those showers will keep you in the mid to upper 50s, mostly sunny next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the Kern River Valley also a chance of some showers by late Saturday. This is going to be a rain event. Uh, snow levels will be above 6,000 feet. All right, thanks, Kev. Yep. Well, still to come, the green is going away. More people are swiping than using cash, but the safety of your money could be at risk. We'll explain. KGET Business Watch is brought to you by Grapevine MSP Technology Services, the Valley's leading IT service provider. Welcome back in your 17 Business Watch. America is fast becoming a cashless society, purchasing everything from food to furniture with credit or debit cards. For years, people have been debating whether cash or card is better for the safety of your money and your bottom line. Roughly 3 in 10 U.S. adults say they make no purchases using cash during a typical week, which begs the question, does the way you spend actually affect what you spend? NBC's Gotti Shorts puts cash versus car to the test. Money used to mean a bunch of coins and cash. But these days, it seems to be more plastic and glass. Going cashless has become more common than ever these days, with cash making up less than 30% of consumer transactions in 2018, according to the Federal Reserve. But not all Americans would rather swipe or tap. Some still use cash more than cards. So as mindless subscriptions and credit card debt grows, can cash actually be a way to pump the brakes on what you spend? So I decided to try a week of using only cash and then a week of cashless. We're going to start with cashless, because I'm one of the 3 in 10 Americans that almost never use cash. Look, I don't even own a wallet. I keep all my stuff right here inside of my phone. And no surprise, I spend way more than I should. All the Amazon clicks, swipes, Ubers, Venmos back and forth, really without ever noticing how much I actually spend. And then on the last day, a snag. So I have finally found myself needing actual cash. I'm trying to go to a place, but they take cash-only parking. So I've parked three blocks away. I'm gonna go for a little walk. And this is a battle taking place all across the country as some businesses try to stop accepting cash altogether. While critics say the practice discriminates against people without bank accounts or credit cards. Now time for the cash test. I'm about to start off the week with $100 and see how long that lasts. I got some groceries, a coffee, but after I filmed all of it. Shoot, so much for $100 a week. I already have to spend more than 100 bucks at Best Buy. I need a hard drive because my phone ran out of space, so... Now, I gotta go find some more money. From then on, I started noticing simple transactions took way longer. I also started stressing about whether I was carrying either too much cash or too little. <laughs> okay, uh, I didn't even realize I was missing this, but it looks like money is just falling out of my pocket. And this happened a lot. About to meet a friend for coffee, but uh, I forgot cash. The good news, I spent way less money. The bad news, uh, I'm a mess. All right, a uh, little bit of a snag. I am looking for $20. I've checked all of the pants that I've worn this week. Nothing is in my dirty clothes. And while I'm clearly not the ideal test candidate, using only cash forced me to pay more attention to where my money actually went. Thirteen forty-three. Proving the battle of cash versus card might not be spent anytime soon. Got a shorts reporting. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. One dog who started his sled racing career with a bang suffered a series of setbacks that left him totally blind. But he refused to sit on the sidelines, and the husky named Indy is living up to his name. Reese Lindquist has more. Musher Frank Moe has 43 dogs on his property. 28 of them are in training. And none of them are quite like this seven-year-old Alaskan Husky. We are really grateful to have him. And, and Indy became a star almost right away. In fact, he, was, he finished the Bear Grease Marathon when he was two. 
Fast forward to the summer of 2016, the prodigy lost one of his eyes to a rare disease known as lens luxation, nearly putting his racing career in jeopardy. We still ran him, um, but then he lost the other the sight in the other eye too, and, um, and it took him about a year to get used to being totally blind. Because of his high energy and other heightened senses, sitting the races out wasn't an option. We couldn't just not run him, you know, he... He uh, was very upset, clearly, when the other dogs would take off you know, for a training run. And despite his visual limitations, Indy is just like any other dog. <laughs> They're more than our pets, you know, they are our teammates. And, and he had such beautiful blue eyes and was such an incredible dog in love to run. And we were just, when we were personally upset, obviously, but we were really upset for him. After years of training to get him back into the racing flow, including practice, with the older dogs and running in smaller races, Indy is now ready to mush in bear grease again, even without his sight. This year we started training him uh, just like he was going to be one of the marathon racing dogs. And, uh, and he looked great. In fact, he looked uh, almost as good as he was as a two-year-old, pretty close. In fact, he was one of the best dogs in the team. With a slew of injuries to his sled dog team, Mo decided not to run in the bear grease 300, Instead, he and his eight dog team opted for the mid-distance Bear Grease 120 with Indy in the wheel position. He was happy and wagging his tail. He was ready to go again. So for Indy, the dog that almost didn't race again has become an inspiration for dogs of all shapes and sizes affected by the same disease. To know that their dog is going to continue to improve. It's, it's like he was saying, Dad, I'm back. All right, we'll be back after this. Welcome back. The parents of newborn twin girls, desperately in need of blood donations, got a chance to express their gratitude to donors. I really want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. A relatively normal pregnancy. An emotional Ruby Alatori and her husband were invited to Houghton Blood Bank yesterday. The couple got to meet some of the O negative blood donors who answered the call for help when their daughters, Maya and Gloria, were born. It was hard not to get emotional. Um, we thanked them um, for coming out um, because they they didn't just help our babies. Um, I mean, it helps a lot of a lot of other you know babies. You may remember the babies were born prematurely. The couple was also given two gift baskets, one for Maya and one for Gloria. The couple says the babies are doing well. I just love, I just love seeing that story. It's all about coming together and helping out. Absolutely. All right, thanks for joining us. NBC News special report coming up after this. 17 News, your local news leader, continues 24 hours a day on KGET.com and our 17 News app in the spirit of the Golden Empire. 17 News.